Hello and welcome to the third podcast in our series of podcasts focusing on the competition rules around patent settlement agreements. Today's session is headed up by my colleague Sophie Lawrence, a partner in the Bristow's competition team, and me, Katie Cambrook, a senior associate from the patent litigation team. Our focus today is on so-called relevant markets in the context of competition law and how to assess whether the parties to a patent settlement may be competitors. Um, before we delve into that, Sophie, could you first explain why these issues are important? Yes, so the relevant market is a concept under competition law which effectively seeks to identify the market in which a particular good or service competes. And this is an important part of the framework for any competition law analysis of a particular agreement. Assessing the relevant market is essentially a factual exercise which is focused on the notion of product substitutability. And as you rightly indicated, the key question is why we should care about this when we're looking at settlements. Um, but I think I would break down the way that the definition of the relevant market can play a role in this question into three main areas. First, whether or not the parties to the agreement are considered to be actual or potential competitors will depend on whether they operate or at least may operate on the same relevant market. And that's highly important because there will obviously be greater competition or scrutiny of agreements between actual or potential competitors. Second, how the market is defined will also dictate where, whether a party to a patent settlement agreement holds what's known as a dominant position. And this is again very important because if the patentee is dominant, then it's subject to, um, in competition parlance, special responsibilities. In effect, extra rules which apply to companies with market power. And in this context, this is usually a consideration only for the patentee. Thirdly, the market position of the parties, their competitors and the dynamics of the market generally will also be relevant to the assessment of a patent. OK, um, that makes sense. So. Could you explain how the relevant market would be assessed in the context of a patent settlement? Yes, sure. Um, but before doing so, it's probably worth explaining a bit about the peculiarities of this exercise in a pharmaceutical setting where many of the patent settlement issues arise. Um, the assessment isn't quite as straightforward as it would be if you were talking about a typical consumer product where individual consumers choose between a range of products on factors like price, features and quality. In the case of prescription drugs, it's the patient is really the person who chooses what drug they will take. That choice is going to be made by the prescribing professional. And similarly, the prescribing professional is really the person who has to think in any detail about the price of the product. That responsibility lies with the relevant health authority or insurance company, or in the case of the UK, um, bodies like NICE. Mm. Yeah, and medicine prescription is obviously a highly specialised field. From my experience of advising companies um, on patent law, I'm aware that there's all often a range of products which treat any given illness, but yet equally specific products are obviously highly specialised. How do the competition authorities decide what is substitutable? Um, and is there a kind of standard practice over which products will be included in the relevant markets? So before the sort of raft of patent settlement cases which have been working their way through the courts over the past few years, I would have said that the practice was pretty well understood. Essentially, the relevant product market would usually comprise a class of drugs with the same mode of action, um, but they wouldn't include drugs which act on the body in a different way. So to give a very basic example, competition law would usually distinguish between a group of drugs which merely alleviate symptoms of a disease, let's say these are drugs of class A, and from those which seek to prevent the disease from arising, we can call those class B. Now, this might break down further. For example, if there were two types of drugs which each take different pharmacological routes to inhibit disease. Now, this breakdown of drugs by class and that the reflection of that in the definition of the relevant market was always subject to a range of additional factors such as relative price, indications, availability, prescribing habits, medical guidance and so on. But that was all the basic approach. Now you might think that sounds like a sort of objective assessment, the outcome of which is not going to vary hugely over the lifetime of a drug. 
However, an interesting aspect of the generics judgment is that the court has opened the door to an assessment that also takes account of the relative competitive pressure provided by different products at different times. In particular, that may mean that at the point at which a given drug is facing generic entry, the main source of competition is no longer the other drugs of the same class, but the generics of the particular drug in question. So continuing our example, you're potentially moving from a situation where all of the class B drugs are competing with each other to one where the particular B drug in question, let's say it's B3, is only competing against its own generics. And at a point in time where the generics of B3 haven't yet entered the market, that's likely to mean that B3 has a pretty strong market position, even if it previously faced very substantial competition from drugs B1 and B2. That does sound like a fairly complex exercise, and I imagine it isn't straightforward to define um, the market with much certainty. No, it's not. As competition lawyers, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about how to go about this sort of assessment in pharmaceutical markets. But it's often not possible to reach a firm conclusion, at least without going right through to the kind of conclusion of an investigation or, or a legal case. Instead, it's helpful to assess the competitional risks in the light of the range of different possible or likely market definitions. I should also mention quickly that the European Commission is currently reviewing its guidance on market definition because the existing guidance was published quite a while back in 1997. So, the Court of Justice's emphasis on the dynamic nature of market definition in generics may well find its way into the new guidance. Um, the Commission's already indicated that it intends to make clearer in its guidance that market definition isn't an end in itself. Although it's a, a valuable starting point for a competition law assessment, you shouldn't as a result ignore competition that might come from outside the market, for example. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Um, in addition to the points that, that you've raised, um, there are other factors to be considered as to when companies may be competitors in the context of patent settlement agreements. Some of these factors have come up in the recent cases um, in this area. For example, the European Court of Justice, um, in handing it down its decision in the preliminary reference in the generics case you mentioned, held that generics can be regarded as a potential competitor um, on, so, on the same market as the originator, as you've covered, Sophie. And this holds true even in circumstances where there is a genuine patent dispute between them. In particular, the Court of Justice considered that a generic company will be a potential competitor of an originator where there is a real and concrete possibility for that generic to enter the market and compete with the originator. The generic's decision did not explore every possible permutation of how this would work in practice. But I understand that it would include situations where a generic has a marketing authorization and is ready to enter, but is also likely to include situations where a generic has commercial plans to launch and is perhaps taking steps to enter the market, such as um, applying for a marketing authorization. The Advocate General's opinion in the Lundbeck case, um, another case in this area, considered that the parties were potential competitors, even where the generic did not have a marketing authorization. Critically, the court considered that the fact of engaging in patent litigation is an integral part of the competitive process. Yes, uh, and this understanding that generic companies which are bringing or defending litigation are likely to be viewed as being in some sort of competitive relationship with the relevant originator is really important because concerns about market sharing via a patent settlement will only arise if the parties to the agreement are actual or potential competitors. I think what might be surprising from a patent lawyer's perspective is that the Court of Justice gave very little weight to the existence of patents owned by the originator, uh, which may prevent a generic from legally entering the market. The Court of Justice acknowledged that patents may form uh, part of the economic and legal context of an agreement, but it did not consider that the presumption of patent validity the uncertain outcome of disputes concerning a patent's validity or the existence of an interim injunction would prevent an originator and a generic from being classified as potential competitors. The Court of Justice also expressly concluded that the existence of a process patent for an active ingredient that's already in the public domain is not an insurmountable barrier to market entry. And this same approach was followed by the Advocate General in the recent Lundbeck opinion. 
In other words, a patentee and a generic manufacturer may be deemed to be competitors, notwithstanding the existence of process patents. The generic decision did not consider other types of patents, such as, for example, a compound patent, which cannot be worked around in the same way as a process patent potentially can be. And this therefore gives rise to some unanswered questions as to what this means in the context of other cases. And it will no doubt depend on the facts of any particular case. Yes, I can see that. But I think the tension can really be explained by understanding the basic approach of competition law, and in particular, the focus on the commercial reality of competition in those markets. It's not uncommon for generics to launch products at risk and for this to act as a competitive constraint on innovators. And it's this competitive constraint, which is considered to be a form of potential competition, that is taken into account when you're doing a competition law assessment of of a patent settlement. The core question is whether, when and how patents will be an insurmountable barrier to entry. As you said, the generics judgment looks at the issue of potential competition by express reference to the existence of process patents, and it's not yet clear exactly how the court would apply that same analysis to a different type of patent. To my mind, the same principles should be assumed to apply, although the lower prospect of being of a generic being able to work around, say, a molecule patent is obviously a relevant consideration. And just briefly to note that outside of the pharmaceutical sector, the same basic principles will apply. So although we've been focusing on patent settlements between originators and generics, party settling litigation in other sectors shouldn't obviously ignore the competition laws. Um, Where parties are in litigation, it's typically going to be safest to work from the presumption that they're likely to be considered to be at least potential competitors. Thanks, Sophie. Um, That brings uh, this podcast to a close for today. We hope you've enjoyed listening. Um, If you have any questions, do please drop Sophie uh, or myself uh, a line. The next podcast in the series looks at buy object restrictions uh, under Article 101 of the TFEU. So please do tune into that. Thanks very much.